Again, I thank you all for coming. It's uh, proof in the pudding that New Yorkers are nuts, because uh, I'm a native New Yorker, so I can say that. Um, the uh, weather is just awful. Just walking from Penn Station to here, it's just uh, just soaked. At any event, thank you all for coming. I want to thank B and H. I want to thank Dave and Shoshana in particular. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I think this is such a great service to our photographic community, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I was online uh, just in, uh, various times. I saw Moose Peterson here, so I feel honored that, that uh, uh, Steve Simon was here a few weeks ago. Uh, just some great, you saw that? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, um, it's really an honor to be here, actually. What I'm planning to do is divide my presentation into two basic parts. The first part will be talking about travel photography, and I hope I'll give you some good tips, some insights that I've learned from over 45 years of, of photography. Uh, I got my first camera when I was 11 years old from my father, who is a very prominent New York photographer. Uh, his work, his body of work is now with the Museum of the City of New York because he was a he was an immigrant who loved New York City, loved what America represented, and he did some marvelous work photographing the city in the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, I have photographed for National Geographic, many other magazines and publications throughout my career. Uh, I uh, do an extensive amount of traveling during the year, including photographic tours for people, but also editorial assignments as, as they come up. So with that, um, that as the prelude here, let me ask you this. When you hear the term travel photography, what things does it include in your mind? Let me have some... Landscapes. Landscapes, absolutely. Wildlife. What is it? Wildlife. Wildlife. A lot of people ignore that, but yes, wildlife, absolutely. Florals. What is that? Florals. Unusual what? Floral. Yeah. Flora, the flora and the fauna. The flora and the fauna, of course. Absolutely. What else? People. Environmental folk portraits here. Environmental portraits. People. Culture. Other things. Let's take a look here at. Um, uh, oh, and by the way, let me just say, there's a. Um, if you want to sign up to be on my web, uh, on my um, list, my mailing list. Uh, you can take out your QR code. I'll, I'll put this up at the end also. If you have a QR reader uh, in your phone, this will actually pick up even from the back, and uh, it'll bring you right to my uh, web, website sign up. And then you'll be able to get notices of tours, uh, trips, lectures that I do, as well as tips and techniques uh, uh, that I send out periodically. I promise not to spare, spam you. Um, I do maybe one or two a month at the most, so uh, keep that in mind. Um, I will have this up again at the end. I also have business cards here, so if, at the end of this, if you want to just take that with you, that, that would be fine too. So uh, you've given me your input. Here's what Wikipedia says about travel photography. I don't like to repeat what's on the boards here, but I will say that it's, you'd have to agree this is a pretty broad definition of travel photography. Landscape, people, cultures, customs, history. Pretty broad. It gives us a lot of flexibility in our shooting. Going uh, closer to our hearts, namely a photographic society, um, similarly, we're talking about a lot of things, feeling of time and place, land, culture, uh, et cetera. It doesn't mention wildlife specifically, but I think when they say natural culture in its natural state, let's divorce culture from the natural state and say it'll include um, wildlife. But I also want to call your attention to feeling because we're going to be talking about that today. Feeling, compassion, uh, and, and passion that you have in your travel photography. So here we go with the um, uh, two broad definitions. So it gives us a lot of flexibility as photographers. What I'd like to do now is, if you'll bear with me, is, uh, and we'll, we'll turn off the lights, is uh, I'm going to take you through a tour, if you will, around the world with using my travel photography that I've taken in different places around the world. So sit back, enjoy, and if you need to take a nap.
So my specialties are travel, wildlife, and landscape. Uh, what I'd like to do is get into some travel photo tips and tell you some stories as we go along, give you some tips and some t techniques that I think may be helpful uh, as, as we um, move along here. So the first thing I want to talk about is research. It shocks me, really, when I lead a trip or I hear about people going on uh, photo trips spending five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, maybe even more if you're going on a uh, photo safari in Africa. And I find that the people have not done their basic research before they go. Even on my photo tours, even though I provide people with advanced material, I find that sometimes they don't um, spend the time researching. Because I firmly believe that uh, preparation is critical for taking a photography. That you, we always look for those unexpected moments for the surprises, yes. But I, I firmly believe that uh, you should do your research before you go. Now, I'm reflecting my age by showing you that I look at books, right? But I do. I still like to get uh, books about the places that I'm about to visit, especially if I plan to visit more than once. So if I go back repeatedly, I'll get guidebooks so that I can pick up some new things the next trip, et cetera. But please, nowadays, it's just amazing the, the breadth of information that, and the depth that's available on the internet. So another thing you should do, of course, is go to the internet, do your Google searches uh, for places. Don't forget to hit the banner at the top that says images. And take a look what other people have done in terms of the photography so you know what to expect. OK? All of these are important. Go to websites, not necessarily pictorial websites. Learn what the cultures and the customs are in the places you're going to visit. I remember one time when I was in, early in my career, I was in Egypt. And I was speaking, to, it was, um, I was there to do a, a photo assignment on Anwar Sadat and his wife, Jihan Sadat. Uh, they, uh, he was assassinated two weeks before I arrived. Uh, so I'm sitting there at a meeting with a group of people. There was only one woman in this group uh, sitting around a table. She said something that she misinterpreted what I had said for the rest of the group in Arabic. So I put my hand on her arm and I said, no, no. <gasps> it was like that, that advertisement where everybody is, is silent suddenly because you, know, you don't touch a woman in a Muslim country um, if, if uh, she is not your wife. So, there are things that you can learn on, on, uh, online that will help you, I think, make that travel photography a little bit easier. So then after you do that kind of research, you have a decision that you have to make. Do I want to differentiate my photography from what I've seen or not? Now I say or not because, let's face it folks, if you are going to Paris, I don't care that there have been four billion photographs of the Eiffel Tower, you are going to take a picture of the Eiffel Tower, right? You just wouldn't not do it. Or maybe the Louvre, or wherever you are, you're going to be taking pictures, in, in most cases, of iconic spots. So you have to make a decision then, uh, do I differentiate or not? And this is where I feel your research comes in handy because what I do, and I recommend that, that uh, people who uh, do tours with me, is create a shot list. What do I want to take when I get to that place, right? By looking at previous work, you can say, hmm, I like that shot, but I want to be there at sunset. Or I like that shot, and wouldn't that be great, the lighting at just after sunrise? And I'll show you some examples of that. But you understand what I'm, my point here is to make the differentiation. What do I want to do differently? And what things do I want to just capture because I'm there and I can't not capture it? Let me give you an example of this. I was on assignment for a, um, a publication, uh, and I had to do a photo assignment on Sydney, Australia. Now, everyone who goes to Sydney takes a picture of the Opera House, but if you look online, 99% of them will be taken from the other side because that's where you access the promenade and there's a nice backdrop of a bridge and some, some natural areas. So everyone tends to take that shot. But I knew that the editor wanted to talk about the busyness of, of Sydney Harbor. So I walked around the promenade, came to here, 
so I can photograph, again, this is my decision on how I would differentiate uh, Sydney Harbor in this particular case. Uh, and a busy harbor it indeed is. Okay, so those two things, research, differentiation, and you're basically ready for your trip. Now, here's the second thing, big point here. As much as lack of research shocks me, I'm really surprised that when people are spending an, a fortune for a trip, they don't hire or consider hiring a local guide. Now, if you're on a tour, obviously you're not going to do that. But if you're vacationing with a family or you're, you're going on a photo tour yourself, for example, you're going to Iceland and you're just going to be driving around the Route 1 and, and um, staying at different B&Bs or lodges, uh, it helps to hire a local guide. And they're inexpensive. In Sri Lanka, in, in, in India, you can get a guide for $50, $50 US uh, for the entire day and make the person very happy, right? A couple of things to consider with the guide that I want you, at least things, uh, some tips I'd like to point out. How do you find a guide? I've always, people always ask me, how do you find a guide in the first place? Well, some travel agencies will have contacts with local people that they use and they'll suggest a guide. I have found that what's really helpful is to go to photography forums, right? Go, to, uh, go online, every single city in the world, every rural area even, I've been in, in, in Africa, in the Yukon, wherever, you have people who know the area really well. And many of them nowadays are specializing in taking photographers. That's critical because they know about light. They're going to take you there when the light is best for that particular area. Even during the day, we all complain about flat lighting, but there are some spectacular things you can do during the middle of the day when you're doing travel photography so that you can make use of that guide um, throughout the day for if you have him or her for eight hours. And by the way, in most countries, it'll be a him, not a her. Unless you're in the Western country, then, then you have, um, I was in Finland uh, once and hired a woman who was a guide and she was absolutely fantastic. So uh, you'll see that more, but they they're tend to predominate in Western and more developed nations. Another thing um, that I want to mention about a guide, and hear me out on this one because I think it'll hit home with a lot of you. You go on vacation with your family. Photography, family, right? Not good, not a good marriage there. Um, because you want to focus on the family. You're out there, you've got a camera in hand, you're not paying attention to them, it's bad. Uh, a recipe for disaster. My solution, hire a guy for four hours. Send your family to a museum, let them do shopping, whatever it is, go to a park and get four solid hours to yourself. Uninterrupted, focused hours to yourself. It'll be the best money you ever spend. What I recommend is I, I do a one four, one five rotation, I suggest. If you're away for four days, take a half a day for yourself. If you're away for five days, same thing. But if you're away more than that, every three or four days, take a half day to yourself. That's it. It's inexpensive. The family will generally understand. They're not trudging along behind you, waiting for you to take that picture, right? So it's something that you might want to consider. I think it's a, it's a, um, uh, overall a positive. As an example, um, this is um, a tour that I lead every year in Sri Lanka and uh, uh, this particular gentleman here, Forrest, um, is uh, an avid bird photographer. He's one, of, he's one of my clients on this trip and the guide um, is uh, a, we call him Heti and his, his actual name is Superna Heti Archichi we all call him Heti. Uh, every time I go to Sri Lanka, I hire Heti. And he is also happens to be the second best birder in all of Sri Lanka, which is quite an accomplishment because there are a lot of, there are some amazing birds in Sri Lanka. So we don't focus on birds, but in this case, I put Heti into the um, Land Rover with, with him so that he could point out uh, things to Forrest. Um, so a guide, even I use a guide, even though there are places that I know like the back of my hand, maybe in those cases I'll be the guide, but in some cases I uh, even hire a local guide who knows, may know the area in much more detail. And, and we play off each other. 
important thing about travel photography. People often come to me and say, yeah, well, yeah, Les, we understand you're the travel photographer. You're out there. You're shooting all the time. <laughs> well, you know, I do travel a lot. I, I probably on the road four to five months out of the year, uh, sometimes a little bit longer depending upon my assignments. But I'm practicing at home. I believe that you should polish your technique locally in order eventually to apply it globally. You've got to know your camera. The time to read your manual is not when you're at the Eiffel Tower and there's a strike or whatever and you're hurrying, you want to get the shot that you want, right? So don't, don't um, depend on your being conversant with all these things when you get on site. Practice, practice, practice. I live in a little, a very historic town on the Chesapeake Bay. Its name is Habit de Grace, Maryland. And uh, in my backyard, uh, there are, there's this um, very historic lighthouse. The, our town was destroyed in the War of 1812. The British sat right offshore here and, and uh, uh, with their cannons on their warships destroyed the town. This lighthouse is very historic because it's been standing throughout that time period. But I go around town and I say, oh, well, here's a compositional element. Maybe I'll shoot the lighthouse from these propellers that are in a maritime museum right near the lighthouse, right? So I walk around. This is a, a stream that is right near my house with a waterfall. Um, I like to do a lot of stream photography, so I'm constantly wading into streams, practicing my technique, make sure I don't overextend myself and uh, so I can grab uh, shots. And when I'm there, when I'm on site on my travel, in travel, away from my home base, I know what to do. I, every situation I try to take into account. Um, a, a fall day, this park is uh, walking distance from my home. And I was driving home from the gym one time, and I, I just saw those cows in the pasture. I decided, what the heck, I'm going to just take that photo. It's not a prize winner, but the point is that I'm practicing. And that's what you should do, whether you're a city person or a rural person, practice, practice. That's, that's what's going to make your travel photographs when you're on site rise above the mundane, right? So once you practice um, locally, then when you face weird situations, you can apply them globally. For example, uh, here I am on a um, Canadian lake. Who can tell me what lake this is? Extra bonus points. Lake Louise. No, you would think so. It's 11 miles away from Lake Louise. I'll give you another hint. Same lake, different time of year. Sunshine. What is it? Sunshine. Nope. Moraine. What? Moraine. Moraine. Who said that? OK, you get an extra candy when we're done here. <laughs> uh, Yes, this is Moraine Lake, one of the most sacred spots in, in, uh, to the First Nations people. They call their native indigenous people First Nations. And these, there are 11 peaks surrounding this lake. And um, the lake was so sacred to those people that they never camped here. They would come here, have their spiritual practices, and then leave because it's so incredibly gorgeous. Um, I photograph this. I'm up in the Canadian Rockies a lot. Um, I photographed this in the, in the um, late summer. Uh, but I want to tell you about this shot. This, this one has won several awards. Here's the story with this. I wanted to photograph it. I, was on, uh, I did a photo tour in, um, in the Canadian Rockies. And it was over. And I stayed an extra day. And I knew I needed to get back to Calgary to catch a flight at 6 PM. I mean, it was two hours. And Marine Lake's about two hours from Calgary. So I got there about 7 in the morning and got various shots. It was a miserable day. It was the worst day you can imagine. Cold, freezing rain. And then the first snow of the season came in that day. So I went to the top to this vantage point to photograph it. And who was there but Rod Lowe, the famous large format photographer who sells his images for $100,000 and up. Uh, so Rod said, we're there, and I hadn't eaten breakfast. I'm the kind of person who has to eat. So by uh, noon, I had a raging headache. Neither of us had food with us. Uh, one o'clock comes, two o'clock comes. There's always hints that the sun might break through, but it was miserable. Finally, at 3 o'clock, Rod, Rod says to me, uh, I got to go down to my van. He's got this gorgeous van that he drives around the country with uh, and with his um, uh, banners because he's won several awards. And um, 
I, he said, just watch my equipment. This big 11 by 14, large format camera, a ladder to get up to it. Um, $200,000 that camera cost, custom made by wow. Schneider Optics, right? <laughs> so he, he's, uh, he says, just watch my camera. So I said, sure, I'll watch it. Literally 10 minutes later, this happened. The sun peeked out. I got my shot. It closed up. It started to snow. Ron comes back, Rod comes back up. He said, anything happened? No. No. <laughs> no. Let's, let's go. So, um, but again, for just those few minutes, how it lit up the, this uh, cliff and uh, the water turned. It's the typical sunny blue. Uh, but uh, that was always a laugh. Ron, uh, Ron stayed there another three days. Three more days, he got a really nice shot, a, a, a horizontal um, shot, a landscape shot, but, uh, uh, and that's the kind of photography he is. He will stay a week at a spot to get, to get the right shot. Uh, but once again, apply globally so you know what to do in, in extreme weather, right? Um, or, or cold, uh, lots of reflections from the mountains, lots of snow. How do you handle that? Which lake is that? Those of you who have been to the Canadian Rockies. Okay, this is Peyto Lake, P-E-Y-T-O, Peyto Lake in the Canadian Rockies, uh, always year-round, uh, eminently photographable. It's just a fun lake to photograph uh, there. Uh, here's a, um, one of my favorite places to go, and it's, I don't know why it isn't better known. This is, um, it shows up better, I think, on this, this screen. Uh, it is, um, this is known as Wedge Pond, Wedge Pond. It is literally 20 minutes from downtown Calgary. You land in Calgary. What I do is I land in Calgary, I stay at the Sheraton Hotel overnight, I get up at 4 a.m., 4.30 a.m., depending upon when sunrise to be, I rush to this lake, and um, I set myself up. Every sunrise is like to die for. It, it's a, just an amazing lake. And this was a kind of a windier day, but when the reflections are just right, and I have other images of it taken over the years, it's a, it's a great place for photography. So again, you have to, I needed to be prepared for this. I had to know that I had to use a graduated neutral density filter to tone down that brilliant sky and those, the brilliant reflections off the top. So I practice with that. I don't take it for granted that I'm just going to be able to remember everything, especially at my age. Uh, but a lot of it's muscle memory, let's face it. But, but I, I practice, and that helps you when you're facing scenes, uh, scenes like this. Sorry, what's the, name of the, lake again? the name of what? The lake again. Wedge Pond. W-E-D-G-E, -E, Wedge Pond. And it's as you're heading toward Banff, you, um, most people take Route 40 to Banff. I urge you, if you're going to Banff, detour at, into Kananaskis Regional Park. There are some scenes there that put the, the Banff and Jasper to shame, and a lot of bear. I, I shoot a lot of grizzly bears, as you'll see a little bit later, but um, I don't mean that kind of shooting, you know. All right. Um, so here we go. I want to tell you about this, because this is extreme preparation. I have been to this lake many times. This is known as a Rampart Pond, Rampart Pond in the Canadian Rockies. It's a little sleeper place. Hardly anyone knows it's there. I've been visiting it for about 30 years. When I first started, believe it or not, there was no grass. No grass there. So over 30 years, that grass is coming in. I, those of you who know me know I have a, a doctorate in ecology, so I'm going to teach you something. It's called eutrophication. What's happening is that grass is continuing to advance into the pond, and eventually, in come back in about 150 years, it'll, it'll, you will not have a pond there. It'll turn to a bog, and then trees will grow in it. They will, their their um, detritus will build up and build up, and eventually be very almost indistinguishable from all of this. Right? So that's eutrophication. So I've been taking this lake for many years. I've never had the shot I wanted. So I realized what I wanted to do was to get extreme um, sharpness going from the very front, the, the, my foreground elements, you know, we always talk about that in composition, from the foreground elements all the way to the back, the mountain, <coughs> excuse me, et cetera. So how did I shoot that? I practiced with my tilt shift lens, 24 millimeter tilt shift lens uh, for landscape, and I got there just before sunrise stayed there for about two, two and a half hours, and kept shooting throughout. 
uh, eventually getting the shot that I wanted, uh, that, I, that at least that was my vision of what uh, I wanted for, um, for uh, Rampart Pond. I also, pra I, I, I'm going to say that 80% of my images are taken on a tripod, believe it or not. But when I travel, there are times when I have to hand hold. And at my age, it's funny, I, I, when I, I remember one assignment I did for National Geographic, I handheld the camera at 1 15th of a second. I cannot do that anymore, folks, especially with the heavy cameras today. So I uh, can shoot maybe at 1 50th of a second uh, pretty, pretty regularly. So I have to practice that technique and make sure that I have my elbows in, I'm, 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 I've got good form. This was taken on a boat, on a moving boat in um, Milford Sound in New Zealand. But I, I, I had to make sure that I had my technique correctly, and that only comes, again, with practice. Um, Jokelskaren Beach in, in uh, Iceland. Um, you can see from here, this was actually a full rage hurricane. 75 mile an hour winds um, blasting through here. Uh, you can see the, the um, aspect ratio is not what you're used to. You can come on in and have a seat. Uh, there is plenty of seats here. Uh, there, uh, I thought for sure, this is a Hass taken with a uh, digital Hasselblad, but I thought for sure my camera would be ruined because of the wind coming in at, and just blasting it, but it, it didn't. I, I kept low to the ground and was able to capture this shot. Again, I, I try to be prepared for all eventualities. I will go out and shoot in the rain. I will go out when it's below zero. I will go out when it's overcast. Some of my best shots that I've ever taken have been on overcast, miserable days, because everyone takes it on a sunny day. But if you want to get some drama in your photo, you want to uh, do it uh, when you have inclement weather. All right, I get asked this a lot about equipment. Uh, what kind of equipment do you use? So let me talk a little bit about equipment in, in, um, in this whole, the whole arena of uh, travel photography. I am a believer in keeping it as simple as you possibly can. I keep on wanting to go out here. I'm sorry, folks. Uh, keeping things as simple as you possibly can. I have a friend who has sold four businesses in his career. He is a multimillionaire. His camera, he had a point-and-shoot camera that fell into the water. It was ruined. So he calls me up and he says, Let's, what kind of camera should I get? This guy has no interest in photography, trust me. And I said to him, Jay, why the heck are you thinking about that? Use your iPhone. Just buy those little things that screw on, and you're, you're set. You're home free. He has thanked me. Uh, I can't tell you how many times since. He travels a lot, just pulls out his iPhone and, and whatever. Uh, I, when I teach a workshop on composition, I always show people the cover of Outdoor Photographer magazine taken several years ago, the cover photo by Bill O'Neill. You, some of you know Bill O'Neill, right, the or the name. Um, it is a picture of a Joshua tree in Joshua National Park, gorgeous, taken at sunset, beautiful gold colors on it, etc. So I asked my, my people in the workshop, and if you take my workshops, you can't, you can't <laughs> tell them you know. But anyway, I asked them, what was that taken with? Oh, Canon, Nikon. Uh, Hasselblad, blah, blah, blah. It was taken with the very first iPhone that came out. Three <laughs> megapixels. Three megapixels. The proof is it's in the eye. It's in your vision. You don't need the fanciest cameras, and it depends upon how you're going to use it. In Jay's case, all he wanted was to be able to send images to his kids and to his um, friends. That's it. If it's going to be online, stay simple, right? I think that that's a key, a key message here. So why do I say that? It's, you, know, you hear Ansel Adams always talking about it's all about the light. I'm going to extend that by saying it's all about light. Uh, I carry a 30-pound backpack when I travel. I've got, I'll show you my setup in a moment. That, that's a lot. I just had to sell this year. I sold my Hasselblad digital setup, all the lenses and everything. I couldn't carry it anymore. It's just too much. So try to go as light as you possibly can, number one. And two, the joy of being simple, try to keep your setup as simple as possible. If you can, go with a point and shoot. Nowadays, they're wonderful. $400 to $500 range, 
fantastic. Telephoto capability, wide angle capability, it's got everything you'd, you'd want. Uh, if, if you're not looking to make huge blow-ups, uh, large blow-ups, and I'll show you some of those a little bit later. You have to make a decision, Micro Four Thirds, DX, FX, please, I urge you, if you're a DX, don't lust after an FX. It ain't what it's cracked up to be. You have to use larger lenses, heavier lenses, etc. A DX may just suit you fine. Stick with the, D, with the, uh, the DX before you make that critical decision to move to FX because you're stepping in, you're opening up a can of worms. So I, I caution you about that. If your needs are modest, stick with DX and lighter systems at that. Wide versus telly. Um, this is something I often am asked. If you're given the choice on travel photography, is all I'm talking about, between wide and telly, you go wide. Because most of the situations you're going to face are going to be, you're going to need the width. You're in a church. You're in a narrow alleyway. You saw some of these images there. A lot of my images are taken with wide angle lenses. I like wide angle also. Do you remember the, seeing that scene with the vegetable vendor looking over this way and all the vegetables aside from him? I took that with a 14 millimeter lens. Uh, lens yeah. And I got in real close to him. But I, that, you get that intimacy in your photography if you are able to um, use your wide angle lens. Now, the, of course, if you're shooting wildlife, forget that. Then you need as much, as much throw length as you possibly can. But, but still, wide versus tele. I'm going to talk about the pro solution, my solution, or what pros use in a, in a moment. But let me stick on wide versus tele and show you one damn picture. Um, and uh, this is the, the Glen Canyon Dam. Uh, some of you are just getting that, I know. Uh, <laughs> So this is the Glen Canyon Dam. I actually took this so close to that dam that you would be quite surprised. But I used, again, a 14 millimeter lens, and I'm able to go edge to edge with it, right, uh, and capture everything in that shot. All right, here's another dam picture. Uh, different kind of dam, though, right? And uh, so we're looking at a beaver dam. Now, I take a lot of close-up um, uh, telephoto shots of beavers as well as other animals. But in this case, I wanted to give a context. This is in, in uh, the Yukon uh, just before, uh, just at, at fall. Look at all the trees that they've cut down, ready to bring it into the lodge for the winter. Uh, there's the beaver, in case you hadn't seen it, heading toward the lodge. And um, this lodge I've been following probably for 10 years. Um, they have now had kits. Uh, at different places, there are now three beaver uh, lodges on this pond, and um, they've really done a good job. It's fun to, to watch this family at work. They're, they're always busy as a beaver. Yes. All right, now the pro solution. So here's my setup, my basic setup for travel. All right, um, I have a Nikon D800 and a D810, so I have those two cameras. Uh, I have a 14 to 24 millimeter. I have a 2470, a 7200, and I always, always carry at least one tilt shift lens because I do a lot of landscapes. So I want to get foreground elements sharp and, and, and looking toward the back. Now, recently, uh, there's a thing called focus stacking. So you don't need to really carry that, but I'm still old school. I'd rather have it in the lens than have to post-process it later. I hate post-processing. So. Um, so this is my basic kit. Now, if I'm doing wildlife photography, I'll supplement this with my 200 to 400 with maybe my 1.4 tele extender. I don't like the 1.7. I don't like the 2.0. So um, the, the, the 1.4 tele extender I use um, you know, with this lens uh, quite a bit. Uh, and, and the 7200, uh, this 7200, I use it a lot also if I'm really close to the animals that I'll be photographing. But I use it with that and my 200, 400. All right? By the way, I just want to mention, I'm not trying to sell this at all, but I recently bought the 8400, the Nikon 8400, and I absolutely love it. So it gives me a chance to leave these two, I, I'm sorry, um, uh, the, um, this baby and my 200, 400 home. Because the 200, 400 is a bear. It's 11, like 10 or 11 pounds. It's crazy. And trying to get that through um, 
through the uh, TSA nowadays, you know, they're always suspicious of something, rightfully so, but it's a pain. Okay, shoot early, shoot late. We always hear that, the magic hours, early morning um, and, um, and late. And it's true, it's true. This uh, image I took in um, Iceland. I was about, oh, maybe a couple of miles away when I saw the sun start to set. It's about, um, it's about uh, 6.30, 7 o'clock at night when I took this. By the way, the shot on the beach that I told you with the hurricane was taken at 10 o'clock at night, right? Wow. Yeah. Um, but this is, um, I saw the sun setting and I, I saw the, refle the, um, the way it bathed that church in this sweet, sweet, warm, white light. So I raced over this rutted road and got to it and shot it. Now this is for editorial use. I was on an assignment. But you see the telephone poles there? If I was selling this as an art image, you should know, I'll let the cat out of the bag, I would probably clone those out if it was an art image. But for editorial work, we don't, often don't have that liberty. You have to have it just as it appeared. So, um, but another thing about this I want to point out to you is I shot this with a Nikon 4.3, aspect ratio of, of, I'm sorry, aspect ratio of 3.2, but I cropped it um, to 1.3, and don't be afraid to do that. I mean, just because you're shooting at 3.2 doesn't mean you have to keep the image at 3.2. You can process it at 1.2 or 1.3, uh, and, and it will work uh, just, just as well. The other thing about shooting early and late is something that I want to emphasize to you for travel photography. It's not always about the light. I love shooting in markets, right? Uh, going out uh, early morning and shooting in the markets. Why? Because early morning, the vendors are still hopeful. It'll be a better day than yesterday. <laughs> They're happy. They're getting ready for the day. There's anticipation. There's dust in the air because everyone's unloading their crap for the day, right? So there's, it's a great time to photograph. This is a, uh, in um, uh, Otavalo, um, Ecuador. I go there a lot. Um, every time I go, I bring photos, prints, that I take in the last time and give it to the people that I photograph there. So now they know the photographer, they don't know, even know my name. Uh, I don't speak Spanish, but they, they, ah, oh, the photographer's here, the photographer's here. So there's some anticipation. I get some good shots that way. Uh, if you went to her stall now, she and her sister own this stall, potatoes and corn. Um, you'd see one of my images hanging there, just she and her sister, a picture I took of she and her sister. So it's a good, t a good thing to do. I often mail images to the people that I photograph, and, um, uh, and if they're in a rural, really rural area, I figure out a way to get it to them. Oftentimes, I'll mail it to a hotel nearby and arrange for them to, <clears throat> excuse me, to come and pick it up. Okay, uh, so it's not just about the light, but it is definitely about the people. That's something I want to encourage you when you're photographing to go out and shoot people. Isn't that what travel's about? To learn about new, other people, about the culture, about um, all sorts of good stuff. It always amazes me once you start talking with people. I'm a grandfather, so I love to talk to people about the grandkids, et cetera. It breaks the ice and it makes for a good, um, a good co a conversation breaker. So here are some rules, folks. Ask permission. I get so upset when I see people surreptitiously taking a telephoto shot of a person, um, particularly in Muslim countries. You're, it's really disrespectful, hugely so, and can get you into a lot of trouble photographing women without permission and get, or giving them a chance to put their veil up or to refuse. I see people get their cameras and just go right up to someone like they're, like they're a piece of meat, like they, there's no sensitivity, no respect there. So you should ask for permission to photograph people. What I do is I ask, and rarely people will say no, and I say, fine, smile on my face, that's okay. There are something, what are there, six billion people in the world? So if they say no, I still have like 5.9 billion people left, so I can, uh, at some point, I'll be successful in asking. So I ask for permission to photograph people and some places. I recently got messed up in Malta. I was there, I wanted to photograph a church. I got all my equipment, and they wouldn't let me in. 
you needed permission from the bishop, I didn't have time to get permission, I lost out on that photo shoot, right? Um, so you may need permission for some places too. Let me give you an example of why permission works so well. I was with a group of friends who were also photographers, and um, there, it was a, a miserable fork. We had photographed the whole day, very tired, all the way into sunset, and um, the next day, I said, got up early and I say, how about let's go to the Acoma Pueblo. The Acoma Pueblo, for those of you who don't know, it sits on a mesa, just like this one. It's that small. And it's the oldest continuously occupied community in the United States. The oldest continuously occupied. So there are 40 people who live up there. The actual village is three miles away. But to keep up the continuously living there, there's no water, no electricity up there. 40 people rotate on for a month and then rotate off, OK? So that's it. So I went there. They didn't want to go. So I went by myself, brought some cheese and crackers for lunch. I spent five hours there. And I walked around the town. Um, it's on a mesa. Nothing's paved there. This is what you have. Um, I, this is what, known as a kiva. So people will walk up this ladder onto an area where they have their spiritual practices. Um, so I walked around, I loved the clouds. I, see, I told you, I like going in inclement weather. You get more dramatic images. And uh, this is an example of what they have to deal with. There, since there's no electricity and plumbing, uh, they have to bring up any water they have with them, and they have to use outhouses. So I was walking around. I talked to some of the parents. I talked to the kids. I sat down and ate. I always carry extra things for kids. I uh, gave it to them, flashlights or... or um, uh, or uh, energy bars, and uh, this boy had two brothers, a much younger brother and, a, and an older brother. Um, so I wanted to photograph them all, but every, he was very willing, and actually he's laughing because his younger brother, when I went to take a picture of the younger brother, the younger brother ran away crying. So he started to laugh, and I turned around. This is what made the whole day worth it, because the parents are comfortable with my photographing them. When I turned around, the little boy had run to his older brother, right? The brother has, uh, is, has Down syndrome, but the love and the caring and the protection there was so sweet. And what makes the picture for me is the mother looking here anxiously <laughs> because she heard the baby, the younger kid crying uh, or screaming because I was about to do something dastardly, like take his picture. So, um, so it, I got the shot that I wanted, uh, ultimately, by asking permission and by just relaxing into that photo uh, shoot. Be a good ambassador, something I'm sure you all have done before. Uh, you take picture, this is in Nepal. Uh, you know, you show people that, right? Everyone, everyone does that at some point, and people really love it. But also being a good ambassador is having fun yourself. Uh, this shot. <laughs> Was uh, I was photographing these Sudus in um, Nepal, and a uh, uh, terrible tragedy there with, their, with that earthquake. Uh, I know many friends who have lost everything. Um, but they asked if I would come over and just sit with them and, and just, just have some fun. They would give me actually a blessing, which they did, and then they hammed it up. And this is uh, one of my, stu one of my um, tour participants, uh, Norm Arnold. So Norm, if you're watching this, thank you. Uh, Norm took this of, of me uh, sitting there. Be patient. If you're traveling, it's, sometimes you're on a schedule, try to just relax and be a little patient. I'll give you an example of this too. I was in uh, Nice, France, my wife and I, we were uh, walking to a market to, to do some vegetable and, and, and fish shopping. And um, this woman was at this window. I love French windows. Right? So I, I picked up my camera and I pointed to it. No, she didn't want a picture taken. OK. Smile, laughed, walked on. An hour and a half, we walked around this market and, and uh, bought our stuff. And she watched us. Right? I came back out. And I laughed at her. I said, now? She said, OK. <laughs> I got the shot. Right? Just some patience. Sometimes waiting for the right shot is the thing to do. This one, <laughs> obviously I was in Nepal, and I was waiting for lunch. And this is another patience thing. I was hungry, waiting for lunch, and 
this young man was, and his girlfriend, he had this t guidebook right here, right on the table. And he was thumbing through it and thumbing through it. And I said, please, I prayed to the photo gods, please let him pick up that book, which eventually he did. I got his shot. It's a violation of my, of my uh, uh, rule that I told you about, but I went right over to him and I showed it to him. I have had people said they don't want me to have it on. Most of those are religious, for religious reasons, or spiritual reasons, I should say, because some people believe it's a capture of the soul in, in very remote societies. So uh, I delete it right in front of them, in that case, show them that it's not there at all, because I don't care about, the image is not that important to me. But here, I knew if I could get the shot, he, he was happy with my using it. And um, I figured if I ever do a slideshow of Nepal, that's a great title slide, right? So again, patience, patience, patience. Another thing I want to talk about is uh, this tendency for everyone to shoot at F8 or F11. Uh, I, I urge you to get out of that, that mindset, because especially with people, you should shoot wide open. A quick example. I am very blessed to be uh, adopted, if you will, by the Seashell Tribe of British Columbia. I have paddled with them. I have photographed them. Uh, this young man, uh, his name is Robert Higgins. Uh, it's his coming of age ceremony. So I was one, one of only five white people to have ever seen this. 14 hours, they closed the doors in a, log, in a long house, it's called, and um, all his relatives and so on there. Uh, once the doors are closed, you cannot leave. You're there till the end. So it was 14 hours in late. Um, excellent food, great, you know, great camaraderie, et cetera. But in this particular case, Robert is getting his blessing. His, his grandmother, by the way, is the matriarch of the tribe, Barbara Higgins. His mother is Holly Higgins, and this is Robert Higgins. His actual um, name, uh, his First Nations name is Nanook. So Nanook is getting the blessing from a neighboring tribal shaman named Sisi uh, here. Do I care that he's out of focus? Do I care that the background's out of focus? No. I want that eye ri that's riveted on this blessing, on this shaman. So I use a wide open lens, 283. I think I shot this at 35. All right? Um, and that's what I'm talking about is getting, um, is using wide open a, a lot more in your photography. Um, let's transfer to wildlife for a moment. Uh, and I'm just sticking this in here because it just came up. I was in South Africa, and this is a Kalahari lion. And I just was driving by, and there he was in all his glory. I sw his paws were that size. They were unbelievable. Um, I don't care that he's out of focus here, over there, and up here. I don't care. His eye is in focus. And I lucked out because he moved his head in such a way that the plane of focus happens to be his eye, his teeth, and his chin. So I get them all in focus. But I didn't care if this was out of focus. I have other shots where it's out of focus. If his eye's in focus, that's the critical thing, right? So that's important. But whatever you do, my point is, with the exception of the lion, is photograph people. I think you will find it to be very, very rewarding. Again, uh, just a woman standing in her doorway in um, uh, Chitwan, Nepal. Here are those same boys that I showed that showed the back of the camera to beforehand. And I love it, just occupying themselves by playing this simple game with paper scraps, essentially. This guru is funny. Uh, uh, he's a famous guru in Sri Lanka. And uh, I asked if I could take his picture. He said, sure. And he sat down and took out his comb, and first combed his beard and his hair to make sure that he was all presentable. Uh, so I thought that was cute. Um, this woman in Nepal, listen, folks, it's not because I'm old. It's because since I've been in my 20s, I have photographed old people. I just love their expressiveness, their wrinkles, their every one hard earned, I'm sure. This woman in um, a mountain village in Nepal, um, just look at her joie de vie in her eyes. She still has that. Um, about to break into a smile. She didn't want to smile because her teeth were bad, but, um, but still in all, uh, uh, people. This is what our travel's about, in my opinion, my humble opinion. A grandmother and her daughter, they, the knife was not for me. It's because she was peeling um, green beans with her, with her daughter. By the way, the food in Sri Lanka is, is fantastic. Fresh food, uh, lots of vegetables. 
This one's a favorite of mine because I was interviewing this man, just sitting there talking to him. My camera was on my lap. I was sitting cross-legged right in front of him, and we were talking. Turns out he, he's Sri Lankan, but he has a master's degree from Oxford. So he spoke perfect English. Um, so we were talking, and then his twin girls just came running over to him, and I just picked up my camera and bang, bang, bang. There, there it was. I just love that, that expressiveness, right? All right, uh, we're, we're sort of heading, heading on here. Um, I want, obviously, if you can and when you can, not every shot can do this, try to tell a story in your images. I want to show you a few uh, in, in different contexts, not just with people. But here's, I lived with this Bedouin tribe for uh, a while in the um, eastern desert of Egypt, okay? Eastern de desert of Egypt, large, the most uninhabited place on earth other than the Antarctic. 1,200 people live in 50,000 square miles between Luxor and the Red Sea and Cairo, all controlled by one sheikh, Abdul Zahir Suleiman. He was my host. This is one of his nieces. Um, so the story here, of course, is the garb, right? And by the way, uh, Joe McCrory, this is not his image. We just happened to shoot this at about the same time, by the way, uh, in, in different, uh, different countries. Anyway, um, so I got this shot. I had just given her an energy bar. You can see that here. Don't take energy bars into the high desert because it was 120 degrees that day, and she actually had to slurp it out of the wrapper. So anyway, um, so she got it there. She was 10 years old in this image. When she was 11, the very next year I was invited to the wedding. Um, I did not attend, but she was married to a 50-year-old man. Um, and I'm bringing this up for a reason. When you travel, especially as you travel to some different cultures and more remote areas, sometimes you see some very, very difficult things from our Western perspective. And it's very difficult. Um, I've witnessed you know, women being beaten and whatever, and there's, there are times like that where you can't do a thing. You just have to be there and record, and, and, um, and, and that's it. And so it isn't all uh, roses and nice stuff. Sometimes you have to deal with the nitty gritty. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, this is a man, I call him Rope Man in uh, Cotacachi, Ecuador. Uh, he just came up to me and said, he saw me photographing, he said, would you take my picture? 70 millimeter lens. I said, sure, I'll take your picture. I did. Uh, the only thing I regret in this picture is not offering him 50 bucks for that hat. That, that would have been, uh, been a classic, but nonetheless. OK, so. Um, uh, and here's a, a boy who just had a, a baby sister born, very proud of it. I just loved his eyes, so I decided to take, to take that shot. All right, telling a story, not limited to just people. What about landscapes? Here is a, um, a place uh, in uh, the Yukon. It's Tombstone Valley, and it's the first storm of the season coming in. 18 inches of snow the next morning, but um, just fierce winds and uh, this God's ray that just suddenly opened up. And I'll show, it how, show you how it looks in a print uh, toward the end here when I get, we get to the second part. Good, right on time. Um, here's, a, I, I was in South Africa walking and ran into this, um, I, I looked back and I saw this lioness hunting. And I fir my first shots, and I want to uh, make this a teachable moment for you, my first shots, you know, you're, you're frightened. You, you suddenly are there with this magnificent creature, and you realize how defenseless you are. Um, so my first shots of her were with her right in the center of the screen, because I wanted to make sure to get the shot, right? But as soon as I did it, she stayed there. She started to lower her haunches. And I said, uh, I want to use space as a compositional element, something we don't often do. Use space as a compositional element. I put her in the upper part of the frame so she was in the context of her environment. Again, I don't care that the foreground is out of focus. I've got a catch light in her eye. I've got her uh, in a hunting pose. That's the shot that, that I, I wanted to do. But it comes with practice. You've got to know how to get your camera over, how to focus quickly, and so on. Another tell a story, and this is a, a little bit more involved. I told you I photograph grizzlies a lot. I'm up in the Yukon and Alaska a lot. I admire these animals. They're magnificent. So 
an, a, a decent shot of an animal. I just call it a textbook shot. It's just a bear, a grizzly bear. But uh, one thing I want to say is if you're photographing bears, any of you, when that nose goes to the side like this, back off. So I took the clue, and you learn to read these clues, and, and I backed off from him. Um, another bear, this one in the, uh, 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 in the um, tundra of the Yukon. Uh, we followed this bear for five hours. Uh, my colleague, who's from Yukon, he's a great photographer, uh, Richard Hartmere, he and I went photographing this bear. It is, uh, we thought we understood it pretty well. Richard, um, at one point the bear stood up. That's not usual for a bear, uh, for a grizzly bear. They do it, but not that often. So we figured something's weird about it. Anyway, he stood up and he's actually watching Richard. And that, that's good. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a wildlife photography lesson. Richard is a big guy. He's also slow. You figure out the lesson. All right. So um, here's this bear. And then he crossed the road, that, uh, this dirt road that we were on, and he started to get closer and closer and closer. Now I am on my tripod with a, at 200 to 400 lens. I am at 200, folks. 200 here. And that's the last shot that I was <laughs> able to get before he grabbed my tripod and my camera lugged it off into the uh, tundra, and that you can see where he chewed the, uh, the tripod for a good long time, getting the salt. I think he liked the salt. I think he was just curious. We never felt, quote, in danger, but he did come too close. So I'm, I, go, I get, say to Richard, I got to get my camera, because I figured, I figured it was all broken to pieces anyway. And, uh, but I, I need to get it back. I can't wait there while he chews up all the foam there. So. Um, I have my bear spray. I take out my, my bear spray off my vest, and I go out there. He's saying, no, don't spray it. Don't. He's, a, he's a very into conservation, et cetera. And I said, like, hell no. If it's your camera, you'd be doing it. So I went there. I just gave him two quick squirts, and he left, right? Um, amazingly, I should do a commercial for Nikon for this, I swear. <laughs> Nothing was damaged in my lens. No, uh, the only thing damaged was in my camera. The battery door broke off. So the other lesson for you folks is this. I always carry duct tape wrapped around a plastic credit card so it's not round, you know, it just lays flat. I always carry duct tape with me. I duct tape my camera, and we actually spent the rest of the day photographing him. But we taught him a good lesson. We taught that bear a good lesson, which is not to get too close to people. They don't like that bear spray, uh, but it, thank God it's not like a gun. It wears off. They lick it off. And, event, and, and then they go about their business. But I guarantee you, he will not be coming near humans uh, anytime soon. All right, so I, you see some good bear shots, right? I don't have a story. I still don't have the story I want. I've been taking pictures of them for years. It wasn't until two years later, when I was in Alaska, I was there for four days following a female and her two cubs feasting on salmon. And I, try, I got a lot of good shots, but nothing that told the story I wanted. Until the very last day, I had to leave to get back to Whitehorse, Yukon. I had four hours to shoot in the early morning. I had to leave, leave by 11 AM. Two hours into the, my session, I got the shot that I wanted. This tells a story, right? So here's this salmon sacrificing its life to nourish this wonderful, amazing predator get, to get her through the winter with her two cubs. Uh, look at those claws. Are they absolutely amazing? But this, to me, is the story. It's the struggle of predator prey of life, death, and, uh, and sustenance, if you will. Also, we're about, about done with the first part of this, and I want to say you, you need to have fun when you travel. I, I am totally weird. I love to take pictures of mannequins in weird places. This is a market in, um, in, uh, in Nepal, I think it was. Um, and uh, you know, just, just take stuff. I like splashes of color, so sometimes I'll just take a shot of color. Why? I don't know. I just like to have fun with it. Um, 
this is in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. Everyone takes a picture of the clock tower. You can see the clock up there. Uh, I turned around and I happened to see, and by the way, that's one of my rules. Whenever everyone is pointing the camera in a certain direction, turn around 180 degrees and you're going to find a good shot. Maybe it's a, pi a picture of people taking the picture, right? But either way, you'll find good shots. So I turned around, there was a little, uh, uh, you know, stand uh, there that, uh, that uh, had aluminum panels in it. So I just shot the tower. I have like a dozen shots of it. Why? I don't know. I just having fun, right? Uh, a, friend, uh, a friend, as we were paddling, um, reaching to the boat, fell in. I have bribed her. She owes me a lot of beers. Uh, I owe her beers, I guess. All right. So we're done with the, the uh, and I have to tell you folks, you know, I, as you can see, I have an e-book on travel. It's 234 pages of everything from packing to things. So I'm just picking certain things here that I think would be of interest where I can give you some tips and techniques. But uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, and I'm just trying to get through as much of this as I can. When you get home. Oh, wait, before I get into before, when you get home, I wanted to tell you about this elephant that I took in Sri Lanka. It was like so huge you would not actually believe it. it, it just as I shot it, someone hit my elbow, so I, I'm sorry, I'm just showing you the feet. Or, or the sloth bear also in Sri Lanka. I'm sorry I'm showing it. It's out of focus and it's seeing the backside of it, but that's the best I could do. Or this shot. Actually, there's a leopard in there. Uh, if you look closely, but I'm sorry it's dark. I'm, I, I'm just pulling your chain, right? When you get home, folks, call your images. Please, don't tell me. You see that dot up in the sky? It's a rare eagle that never appears anywhere except here between 2 and 3 p.m., and I happen to get a shot of it, right? If, it's, if, you, if they're bad shots, get rid of them. Show your best images, your best work in its best light, right? That's the thing to do is sh just, I'd rather see three great images than 30 images I'm sitting there, oh my God, you know? And I think you all would be in the same boat. Don't make excuses. When you get home, adjust contrast and color. These are three things you can do quickly. Crop and straighten and use creative effects and filters when you can. Let's give a couple of examples. Here's a, just a mediocre, not a good shot at all, of, of uh, Bow Lake in, in, um, in the uh, Canadian Rockies. Now watch carefully. I'm only going to make a contrast adjustment here. Just contrast adjustment. Watch. Watch. There. OK? Just a contrast adjustment. See what it can do. Take a look at another one. Um, also in the, um, in the Canadian Rockies, I want to get these um, uh, elk footprints here. Uh, and and uh, one moose footprint there. So I took the shot, eh, blah, whatever. Um, but here's contrast adjustment. So we have just the contrast adjustment. But there's one more adjustment I have to make. And that is, well, I mean, I, I, I would go in there and do a lot more to it, but I just want to show you two quick adjustments. The other thing is that you notice the horizon isn't good. Yeah, it's the, the water. Now, this is something as photographers we have a responsibility for. Because just think, when that water flows downstream, what can happen to the next town, right? So you want to make sure to adjust your horizon so that uh, it doesn't, you know, really, crooked horizons drive people crazy. So um, that's a, a simple adjustment. Let me show you another quick, quick adjustment. Um, I took this in Banff, um, uh, Alberta. And um, I, it violates a lot of the rules. You don't shoot wild animals from the back. All right, but I liked the way he was sitting, and I loved that rack and how beautiful it was flowing. Um, I po posed him a little bit off center, but a lot of that st stuff in that scene is extraneous, is not needed, uh, so I need to crop it. Uh, I also need to change the contrast, and as I started to do this, I said, you know what? This is not a color image at all. This should be a black and white image, okay? So this is simple contrast adjustments here, increase the contrast and, and a little bit of exposure tweaking, because you can see the exposure is already there. So all I did is bring up the exposure, bring down the shadows there. I cropped out all that extraneous leaf, because the focus is him, not the other stuff, right? 
All right, so we're done with the first part of, the, of my presentation, talking about the actual travel photography. I'd like to move into the whole notion of displaying your work. Obviously, nowadays we have a great tool. We can do our, uh, display our work online. Wonderful, wonderful tool. Um, and I, it's one I, I encourage you certainly to do. Um, but you can also do slideshows and movies, right? Like in the beginning, that four-minute thing that I showed you was, uh, was, was a little bit of a slideshow. Um, you can make movies. It's so easy to do to nowadays. It's really quite amazing. So you could get used to doing that, learn how to do it. Um, iPhoto has that, iMovie, um, and there are bunches of other competitors. Books. Nowadays, they're very, very easy. You go onto Blurb or, or Apple, and you just throw in. They have templates already set up. Throw in your images, and bango, you're, you're in good shape. I want to talk more about the physical art um, here and then show you some examples where we extend the physical art to areas that, you, that I th hope will be new and exciting to you. So uh, Dave, I'll need the lights again. All right, first, full disclosure. I am sponsored by Museo um, Fine Art Papers. And I'm sponsored by Canon printers, not their, <laughs> obviously, not their cameras. Um, so uh, what I have for you here, I want to talk about some of their papers, but the same thing is true. For, we use other papers, too, of course. Um, when you're done, when we're done with the, the thing here, come up here and get a brochure, if you'd like, of their papers. There's a, um, uh, what do you call it? What do you call it? Sample. Yeah, get one of those. And then uh, you have a free pack of their incredible, everyone will tell you this, this is their, pre, their premier paper, Silver Rag. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. So um, physical art, have fun with it. This is a, just a shot of Baltimore Harbor done on a plain old Max paper. All right, it's done, um, uh, Baltimore Harbor just done on a um, mat paper, very smooth. Come up here, take a look at them at the end, run your hands on them, they're double coated. I spray them uh, with double coat so you can not be afraid. I like you to feel there's something sensuous, something very tactile about prints, right? So we, and we teach a printing workshop because we just love the feel of, um, of uh, paper, of good papers. Uh, another one, what is this? This is also Max. Uh, you, I think you saw that. I think I showed you that image uh, when we did the tour. That was taken in Garden of the Gods in Colorado. In, in um, where? Colorado. Colorado, Colorado Springs, yes. Um, here's a paper that we have absolutely grown to love. It's called Textured Rag. And it, it, um, it, if you go here, you'll feel it. It's, it. it's got a nice texture to it. Uh, not quite like Hannah Mule's. Um, William Turner or some of those other exquisite papers. But this is, uh, what we love about Hanemuel is the consistency, their service, um, and the fact that you know they, it's just a, a darn good product. So we do a lot of printing on, on that. Um, something I want to show you that we do often is um, what we call portfolio boxes. And this is handmade in Rhode Island, made in America, handmade, uh, just a gorgeous piece of uh, thing. We often give these as um, gifts or uh, uh, we had a, a, a nonprofit board buy it for their, for their entire board. And um, we package it in a certain way. But what I want to really show you is uh, what silver rag looks like. So this is an example of silver rag. All right, just a beautiful, beautiful paper. Just, just brings out every highlight, every, and it's not extra glossy. It's very muted, but it, it is a spectacular paper. And I like, I encourage you to come up here. Uh, what we typically do is we have a nice, um, my assistant Bob, who's a master printer. He, um, Bob Boyer, um, we print this overlay on it, and they match up perfectly. And um, then we, ha in this case, I think we have a set of. 12 images here, all of the Canadian Rockies. That's our uh, Canadian landscape series that, that uh, we both sell and also give as gifts. 
So physical art, uh, let me move along. Can I get the lights again? Thank you. Moving along. You can extend your physical art. It doesn't have to be only on, on these paper. We do a lot of wallpaper. You saw this image before. Uh, that's uh, uh, in my opening four-minute um, uh, slideshow. Uh, this was taken in Australia. Uh, I, I actually show you what Providence does. I got lost. We, my wife and I were lost in Australia, and we happened to find this place just on, on uh, so we, we, I got shots of it. But I don't mean the bathroom. We just found the, the uh, waterfall. So uh, it's double coated, so it's impervious to everything. Think about that. Uh, this is our studio. Um, this is at the kitchenette in our studio. Folks, this is taken with a, a wide angle lens, so the kitchen ain't that big. <laughs> Let me tell you. It's a kitchenette uh, that we have in our studio, so when we do workshops, uh, we can have refreshments for people, et cetera. So this is 25 feet long, uh, nine feet high. It's um, a panorama of, uh, uh, in Iceland, taken in Iceland. It's, um, it's 11 images. It's 11 images um, and uh, four rows. Four rows of 11, 11 images and then uh, uh, stitched together. Uh, but, it's, but it's quite amazing. This wallpaper, I'm going to show you a, a live example of it. <laughs> Uh, actually, so let me just show you the next thing is a one minute video of we were commissioned to do a huge mural, 30 feet long by 10 feet high, uh, for a hospital in Baltimore. I purpose shot the panorama of Baltimore Harbor taken during a um, Operation Sail. You know, the tall ships were there. So you're going to see them putting it up. I'll talk to you through it as you go through this. All right, here they are putting it up. You can skip the elevator music. And uh, this image, as you'll see it being uh, hung, is, um, as I told you, 30 feet wide, 10 feet high. It is 14 images across the long way and four rows, taken with a Nikon 400 millimeter lens from a mile away across the harbor. It is so exacting, and you'll, be get, you'll get to see a, uh, an example of it, that you can see people in the windows, all right, standing in the windows. Also notice the different color here in this panel. Sometimes this happens in printing. So at 10 o'clock at night, we had it removed, and then at two, by 2 in the morning, we had reprinted it, and we rehung it, so it's actually quite perfect at this point. But um, if you like at the end of this, this is what the wallpaper is like, very durable, and um, again, uh, made by Museo, but the level of detail in here. David, can I have the lights again for a second? Thank you. Um, the level of detail is just incredible here. It really is amazing. Uh, thank you. I want to give credit. I want to give credit to my assistant, Bob Boyer, who's a genius and one of the best um, uh, master printers around. Uh, he does, just does some incredible work. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.